Yeah, that's cute. All right. Hey, Q, glad to have you. How you doing there, Tim? I'm doing good. Huh. All right. I think I'm just about ready to go ahead and start this. If anybody shows up late, that's fine. Let me shut off Pandora. All right, we got rid of Pandora. So you guys doing okay? Everything good, hopefully? Yes, sir, as good as it can be. Yep, rainy day. Rainy yeah. day recording, by the way. So, yeah, it's yeah. been sort of poopy out, but. Yeah, well, it's a good day to catch up on nice yesterday. Stuff. Yeah, yeah, yesterday was awesome. Good day to catch up on stuff. I've been uh, trying to get the final exams ready to roll. So we'll talk about that. They're going to open up on Friday, but you'll have until next Thursday. So you you got several days you can study. You want to study, and I got all that info's out there. So, okay. Well, first thing I'm going to get going on is I'm going to get going on. Um, let's take a quick look at the. Uh, let me share my screen. We're going to take a quick look at the um, at the week's assignments. Okay, there's, a, there's my screen. So let me go to here. And this was going to, here's, here's our week six. There's the intro video. So this week we're gonna, uh, I got a PowerPoint I'm gonna do on wheels. And that goes over the reading, which you don't have to do. If you do this, you can read it. It's info is in there. There's the video that we watched last week here for everybody else who wasn't in attendance. Uh, break actuation. So break actuation is gonna talk about things like like the foot pedals. The foot pedals have a master cylinder on them, which drives the brake. And some of the brake actuation systems. Uh, there's a video on anti-skid that we're gonna look at, and we're gonna do a little bit on anti-skid next week. I'm gonna go ahead and launch it so you guys can do the, the final exam and stuff like that. But there is a, just a little bit of content next week and it's on anti-skid. So anti-skid is one of the labs that we'll have to make up when we're back, but that'll be very quick. Uh, there's two labs today. I'm going to go over both those labs so you can probably get them most of the way done. There's a study guide for the final exam and I'm going to go over that here at the end too and I'll do a little bit of review for the final. But basically what I say in here on the final exam is the final exam is going to be somewhere I think around 30 questions. It's going to come from a pool of questions so everybody will have a slightly different test but uh, where all the questions come from is from the old quizzes and tests. So if you study your old quizzes and tests, uh, your midterm and the, uh, the other quizzes we've had, that's part of them. And then the ones on uh, this half of the semester, which was when we started doing the e-learning on, uh, those are coming out of an ASA test bank. And I gave you 35 questions on here. There's like, I don't know, between hydraulics and landing gears, like 100 questions. So I pared it down. So you don't have to study, it's like 60 questions or something like that on brakes and wheels. So I pared it down to 35. So I'm gonna take my questions out of that bank of ASA questions of 35, okay? But I'll talk about that here in a little bit. So what I wanted to do now was to, let me remember how to quit sharing this. Uh, let me go back to here and um, stop share. There it is. Okay. All right. Now what I'm going to do is we're going to go over the PowerPoint on, I think wheels first. So I'm going to share my section on aircraft wheels. Here we go. Share. Okay. Here's the PowerPoints. So uh, this is out of the 8083 chapter 13, which is the reading I posted on here. And this is on wheels. So here is a cutaway on a wheel. And here's the two bearings. 
And then you can see they painted red, the outer shell of the wheel. And you can see there's a big cavity in here. I wonder if I've got a pointer. Where's my controls on this? Where's my pointer? Here's meeting controls. Well, so much for the pointer. Okay, but anyway, what you can see on this is you can see the two bearings and then you can see there's a, a series of bolts around here and the bolts go around the bottom of the cutaway and those are called tie bolts and they tie the wheel together. So this is two wheel halves and to get the tire off, you unbolt the two wheel halves. So this is a big airplane. This is, and it, you can see they did a cutaway of the tire too. So if you look off the end of the flanges, you can see where the tires come together and those big pockets there that look like a teardrop shape, those are, um, those are wires. Those, these are steel belted, these are steel belted tires. And so there's steel belts that crisscross and the steel belts all come and meet up here in the bead area. So that's what, that's what that is. Oh, now I found my, my, my annotation stuff. So where's my mouse? Here's my mouse. Okay, there you go. So these teardrop things, that's where the steel belts come together, but they're woven in here. And these plies, there's a ton of plies here. This might be like a 15 ply tire. Um, they're, they're pretty serious. So let's go to the next slide. Okay, so here they're showing us another breakdown. This is a different type of wheel. This is an, what they, I guess the slide says, it's an early two piece. Has a giant lock ring. I've never seen one of these. Here's another one. Now this we do see quite a bit. This is on like a medium sized airplane, corporate jets, things like that. They'll have an O-ring in here and this is a tubeless tire. So that yellow, that yellow piece there, that's an O-ring. And if that O-ring were cut or got to leaking, your tire will go down. Okay, here we have a picture and this shows us a whole bunch of cutaway stuff. Uh, the one thing let's look at here is if you look at this hubcap here, it says Camlock's eight pieces. Underneath this is the, that, that wheel has a hubcap and a protector plate. Now in here, in the center of the wheel is a transducer. What that transducer is, is that's for your anti-skid system. And what it is, it's a little bitty generator. It's like a DC generator, an AC generator. And as the wheel rotates, it generates a, a, a voltage. When a wheel locks, when you have a skid, your wheel locks up. If your voltage gets down to where that wheel is barely turning or the wheel is locked, it, uh, the airplane doesn't sense a voltage and it says, hey, my wheel must be in a skid. Right, so that's how the anti-skid system's gonna work. Uh, we've got our tie bolts here, you can see. They call it down here at the bottom, wheel half bolts. So there's, that's what holds the wheel together. Uh, over here, they got the transducer at the center of the axle. So I'm going, uh, I'm going kinda up from the left bottom side up. There's a valve extension. Now that valve extension, so we can put air in it. Uh, inflation valve, there's the inboard and the outboard wheel half. Now, if you look over here on the top right, we can see brake rotor key, inner wheel bearing. This brake rotor key, this is where our brakes slide in. And we did that, uh, I think last week we showed the multi-rotor brakes. So this is where the multi-rotor brakes slide inside the wheel. And they're showing an axle and a tire, and I think that's about it. Now they've got another cutaway, that, whoop, whoop, too, too much. They got another cutaway down here at the bottom. And let's look at this. Let me zoom in on that a little bit. Okay, now on this cutaway, they're showing us the, that the valve, the air valve is kind of down inside. It, it's, it's not really inside the wheel, but it's very short. And so they put an, an extension on there. You can see the O-ring that's sealing the two surfaces together. And this red mating line here, that's where the two wheel halves bolt together. All right, so that's a, that's a pretty nice picture. And you know how much I love pictures. Okay, so wheel construction. Okay, here's a real one taken apart. The bead area, that's where the tire is gonna ride on the wheel. And you can see the two halves. And there's three bolts that hold it together. Now, just so happens, one of my airplanes, there's. You see these three bolts? Well, there's two bolts and this one bolt is just barely sticking through. 
uh, this week, I broke a wheel bolt on my airplane. So that was a grounding item. I went out to get ready to fly and I noticed that the bolt was missing. It's like, holy cow, I'm missing one of these three bolts. So that's a grounding item right there. I'm not gonna play with fire. So I pulled that off and I found I had a broken axle on there. But what happened is when the axle broke, the wheel kind of got stressed a little bit and broke the bolt on the wheel bolt. So that means now I gotta go back and I gotta inspect my wheel halves and all that. But that's what holds these together. And you can see the bearings in there. In those earlier exercises, we, we showed the repack of the bearing. You guys are gonna get to do that when we come back. Uh, that's a lab we're gonna have to make up. It'll be quick. We're gonna knock all these labs out in one day, in, in half a day for this class. But uh, that's one of the things we'll do there. So there's your wheelhouse. Now- How do you think you broke the uh, axle? Um, I think it was a issue of hard landings and metal fatigue. So this axle, in fact, I might get it after we take a break. I've got it upstairs. After we take a break, I'll show it to you guys. Um, this axle was a hollow axle, and it, I, I don't think it was beefy enough. I think it needed to be a stronger axle. Now, metal fatigue is where something bends back and forth. Like if you take a weak piece of wire, you keep bending it back and forth, eventually it'll break. Right. That's metal fatigue. So a landing gear goes through metal fatigue. As you, as you touch down, you flex all this metal. So that axle was flexing, which is okay, but if you if something starts getting overstressed, you know the more you bend that wire back and forth, sooner or later it's going to break. And that I so I think it was a metal fatigue issue. Gotcha. And it could have been it could have been I had a couple hard landings. Could have been Tim's a Tim's not the <laughs> not the <laughs> slickest pilot around. Okay, but I don't know. I don't know. So so anyway, yeah yeah. Um, after break, I'll. I'll uh, I'll bring that axle down and show, show you guys. Okay, so anyway, uh, here's somebody putting on an O-ring. So uh, when I worked corporate, we had a Gulf Stream. We had some of those airplanes kind of like what you saw down at Great American, those really beautiful corporate airplanes. Uh, as a mechanic, most of the time you spend, uh, you spend your time, um, you spend your time polishing airplanes. <laughs> So um, there we are uh, putting an O-ring on. And I want to take a quick look at something here real quick. I just want to make sure that there's nobody else in the, um, yeah, waiting to get in. There's a setting on this, on this, um, on these controls. Let me get out for a minute. Let me take just a second here and get out. There's a setting on these controls. Yeah, I don't see anybody. That has a waiting area. and here we go, manage participants, whoops. And so if someone's late, it's possible that they, okay, I don't see anybody there, okay. Yeah, it, this online learning stuff, there's a million controls to this stuff. Okay, go back to sharing the screen here, where we are, there we are, okay. Okay, so there we are putting an O-ring on. And here's a nice hand sketch. And they're showing the tire tread up here. And they're showing uh, the bead. And there's the wire from the bead. So I guess I was right. I did know what I was talking about this time. Even a blind squirrel gets it. Even a blind squirrel gets a nut now and then, right, Q? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So here we've got the wheel rim. And it's showing the sidewall, the tire, and the bead. So that's a nice, that's a nice Gary, Gary drawing. All right, we've seen these same plugs over and over again. Now, I will call your attention to this, to this one thing. And if you notice in there, it says, in the middle of the screen here, it says, let me turn on my spotlight. Yeah, I like this. Okay, there's my flashlight. Okay, right here, it says fusible plug vent. Okay, so when we saw that 747 landing and the, the wheels deflated, this wheel got so hot, it melted the lead inside that and let the air out. That's how you keep from exploding the wheel and sending shrapnel. Uh, What'd you say, Q? I was just saying, okay, that makes sense. I was wondering how that even happened without it. I, I just didn't even know how you would deflate the whole tire when it's hot like that without 
Yeah, it's called a fusible plug. And usually there's two of them, sometimes three in a wheel. So yeah, you don't want that thing to come apart like a grenade because if the metal fails and you've got 300 PSI of nitrogen inside that tower, inside that tire, now you got a bomb. Right. So a fusible plug is a safety, safety plug for heat. It's a thermal, it's a thermal relief. All right. And then you got your bead area. That's where the tire is going to ride and it's going to expand against the bead. So, yep. Okay. Here's a crack. This is where they crack a lot is they'll crack right around the bead area. And in fact, it's kind of hard to see. I mean, they've drawn it in there and you can see a nick just above the, the crack, but let's see if we can see a little closer. I don't know if I can really see that crack. Oops. I think I went too far. Now I gotta, whoops, here we go. We're getting it. Got it out of the microscope. Nah, I can't really see it in this picture, but that's where they crack. Now I saw one, I've seen them that, that whole, this whole shell has been, I've seen them usually crack worse than that, where there's a crack that went all the way. It started like over here on the left and went all the way around the wheel, about, about a third of the way around the wheel. And you're like, holy cow, how did that tire even stay on? Um, pilot came out, looked at the airplane, the, the tire looked crooked. And he's like, what's up with that? And he looked at the wheel, he said, well, that's no good. It's pretty obvious. Um, and I don't know if I've got that one laying around or not. I think it's in my office. It's, it's in my office under quarantine. It's <laughs> quarantine for, from COVID-19. So, okay, inboard. So the inboard's where your brakes are gonna ride. And that red arrow is pointing at a lug and your brake rotors on your multi-rotor brake are gonna sit in there. And they're gonna turn the rotors. And then when they hit the brakes, it's gonna squeeze those rotors together and the rotors, the, these slots, or what stops the tire from the multi-rotor brake. All right, there's a wheel next to the brake. So you can see these slots right here, there's your slots. That slot area is gonna line up with one of these slots over here on the wheel half. So to install those, you lock the brakes. You jack the airplane up and then you lock the brakes. You take your wheel off and then those those brakes are all locked in place like that. And then when you put it on, they'll slide right on. If you forget to lock them out, these, these, these rotors will, will drop and slide out of position. And then you, it's a pain in the ass to get them lined back up. You can do it, it just takes you an extra 10 minutes. There's the bearing area. We're showing, they took the wheel, they took the race out of the, out of the wheel. Let me see, both halves contain a bearing cavity formed in the center, except a polish, except a, a cup, a bearing cup otherwise known as a race. So we know that's where that sits and the bearing goes on top of the race. So that's the race we're looking at. There's a little groove above that. That's usually where you're gonna have some kind of locking ring. And that's what's gonna hold that bearing in place, it's gonna be that locking ring. Okay, there's the groove there. And it looks like there's a locking ring. Is there a locking ring? I think that's a locking ring there. So anyway, that's where that installs. That's what holds the bearing in. Then you can see here's a valve core and there's a wheel bolt. And this is a 606 tire. And that's exactly what goes on that motor glider of mine. In fact, if it was here, I might, I might swipe it, put it on my airplane, my poor airplane. Yeah, but we'll get my poor airplane flying again. It says, she hasn't flown her last flight yet. Okay, here is, uh, here's this thermal plug. So it says thermal plug there. There it is right there. So when it gets really hot, if that wheel brake catches fire and you have to have, you're having a nuclear meltdown, that guy here melts first, lets all, the, lets all the nitrogen out before this melts. Okay, this talks about fuse plugs. Here's a, here's a good side view of a fuse plug. And then here, these are different fuse plugs, different types of fuse plugs. All right, what do we got here? What we got here is a damaged fuse plug. So that's where the fuse plug is, and it looks like it looks like it had a nuclear meltdown. Speaking of which, 
It does not look healthy. Now this tire was probably flat. Okay, this is probably after they removed it, brought it to the wheel shop. They probably had a flat tire on the airplane. Somebody went out and said, oh, we got a flat tire, change the tire. And then somebody says, hey, this thing blew a fuse plug. Sucker must have got hot. Now the other thing is, usually when you see something like this, you'll see other telltale signs that this is not a healthy wheel. And look at the rust on those bolts. This thing might have, this thing might have been on a brake fire. I don't know. Okay. Okay, now we're gonna look at the outboard. Uh, that was a, uh, an outboard wheel half we were looking at there. There's your two there. Now, a couple of things about the outboards is a little different is normally what we do is we usually install, well, I'll show you here in a minute. The outboard's gonna have the, uh, the filler valve for the air. Here's the hubcap. Now, you think I can run that wheel without the hubcap? No. I mean, you can, but I guess you're not supposed to. Uh, no, you shouldn't. And the reason you shouldn't is because that hubcap is going to have a little device in there that's going to spin the anti-skid wheel generator. So uh, if you were to leave that hubcap off, your wheel generator will sense, sense a locked condition, which means that it will, you, you will have no, no brakes. It will release the brakes. It'll say, hey, I'm not spinning. That wheel should be spinning and I'm not spinning. All the other wheels are spinning, this one's not, we must be locked. And so it would release brake pressure there. So no, that's, that's required. Uh, on a little airplane, like my airplane, there is no anti-skid, so. But still, just the same, you don't fly air, airplanes with parts missing. There's a wheel speed sensor, that's the anti-skid system here. So if you look at this hubcap picture here in the top right, that guy, fits see the little screw holes there's three screw holes in that i got one i'm kind of yeah three screw holes that hubcap goes on there there's a t-slot in that okay this t-slot that i'm going back and forth on that is up here on this end okay so when that hubcap goes in there a little bar goes in there and when the wheel rotates the axle see the nut axle does not turn but the wheel does so we'll turn we'll rotate this little generator we'll rotate this guy here this end here we got a cannon plug with wires coming out of this the red plug is to protect the the pins where we plug in the wire harness okay but so that's your wheel generator now over here in the bottom right of this picture these guys here they're just another type of wheel generator different shapes and sizes. There's the hubcaps. Wow, there's 76, 76 slides to this. Holy cow, Gary. Um, this is a B-36 bomber. And that wheel, you can stand next to one of those wheels up in the Air Force Museum. You wanna see a big wheel. And yeah, thank God for Photoshop. Um, I'm gonna blow through some of these. So off airport, uh, off airport, off aircraft wheel inspection. Uh, so to inspect the bearings, you gotta have the wheel off. Now, especially on these big airplanes, these tires, you know, when I put air in my car tire, I put maybe 30, maybe 40 PSI. Um, my little airplane, I put 45 in. My, uh, my 10 speed bike, I put uh, 90 PSI in. Uh, an aircraft wheel on something like a 777, you may have 350 PSI of nitrogen in that wheel. Uh, it's enough wow. that when stuff goes wrong, you can kill people. Yeah. So what you do is, is uh, a lot of times airlines will ship those things. Sometimes they'll have air pressure in them. Sometimes they'll have minimal. Um, the safest thing is if they have like maybe 100 PSI in them, and then you put it on the tire on the wheel, and you secure it on there with the axle nut. And once you've got the, the tire mounted on the wheel, it's safe to inflate it. Now the wheel and brake shop has a, has a tire cage and they will put it in a tire cage and inflate it inside a tire cage. If something were to fail, it's inside a cage and it won't kill you. But the safest thing, when I'm working on an airplane, especially a big airplane, and I jack that airplane up off the ground and I'm gonna pull that, that wheel off and replace it with another wheel, say it's a tire change, 
first thing I do is I pull the valve core out and let all the, all the air out of that tire. Then it's safe to take off. Then I can take the axle nut. If you had a broken tie bolt and you jack that thing up and it came apart, it could kill you. But if, if, it, if the axle nut is still holding it on, those wheels can't come apart because it's contained by that big nut that holds it on the axle. So that's why you deflate it first. Uh, do not stand in the path of released air. You can shoot those things. 300 PSI is a lot of, a lot of pressure. Um, I guess uh, people have been hurt by breathing nitrogen. So yeah, let that thing go. Okay. There is a, um, looks like a tire exploding inside a tire cage. That's what keeps you from getting killed right there. There's a, there's a removal, uh, remove only one tire wheel assembly from a pair at a time. This leaves a tire. Okay, so if the airplane falls off a jack, if you have two tires, like a Gulf Stream will have two tires on it. You only take one off at a time. If it fell off the jacks, you still have a tire there. Okay. Uh, if you've ever been around car tires, one of the hardest things to get a car tire off the rim is breaking the bead. That bead gets sticky and it sticks to the wheel. So these are different machines to uh, break tire beads. Now the one in the center is how an airline does it. They have a machine that you roll it up in the machine and it has these big hydraulic cylinders and sounds like a gun going off when it breaks the bead. All right. This is how they do it on trucks and tractors. We don't do that on airplanes because our rims are made out of aluminum and we'll gouge the rim and we can make a, we can turn a rim into junk real quick. And these rims are expensive. You know, that might be, it might be a 5,000 or $7,000 rim. I mean, everything we work or work on, uh, especially with big airplanes is very expensive. Okay. So they're going to show us uh, about taking the, Taking the wheel apart. I don't know what there was to see there. Another picture of the same, the same thing. Uh, do not use air impact tool to disassemble, disassemble the tie bolts. So with airplane stuff, if we take our time, uh, we can do a lot better job and we can, we can tell if something's frozen and, and uh, yeah, air tools are kind of a car mechanics thing. Uh, aircraft wheels are soft and so they're not designed to take the hammering that an air impact tool will do it. Here we're cleaning it. They're bead blasting it. It's in a bead blast that's uh, glass beads, kind of like sand blasting, but with beads. The reason, and sometimes with these airplane wheels, we'll, they'll use something like plastic beads. Because remember, these are aluminum. They're aluminum and magnesium. So they're soft metals and they're damaged easily. Um, then we'll also use chemicals. We, we don't use things like a wire brush that will destroy the aluminum in these wheel halves. We uh, look for corrosion. Corrosion's bad. Usually we have limits of how much corrosion we can have. Okay, these are wheels and brakes here that we're looking at. So we're gonna get these things stripped. We're gonna get all the paint off them. We're gonna bead blast them clean now that I've got a nice, very clean uh, wheel, I can do an inspection on it. I can look for cracks and stuff like that. We'll probably do an NDT. We'll probably send it over for a magnetic particle uh, inspection. So if you remember when we were up in Hartzell, we went in the mag particle room, we had the black lights. When I worked corporate, we had, a, we had one of the shop rooms that we could, pull, we could turn off all the lights and we had a black light in there and that's what we did. Here's some corrosion. This is beyond acceptable limits. You can see it's eating away part of the material. Now look around, look at this corrosion down here around this bolt hole. That's what I'd be worried about. There's where your failure is going to be. Up here by the bead, we can get a stress crack started there too, because these are, this is areas where they'll really crack. Down here in this web area, we don't usually see too much, but we'll see failures around the bolts. We'll see failures around the bead area. Okay, here's a guy shooting Aladine, I think, on there. So when we did wheels, we would, we would clean them, we'd do a dipenetrate inspection, then we'd 
we'd paint them with allodyne, then we'd shoot them with paint. Here's one, it's all pretty, ready to go. This looks like new, but it's probably something that somebody uh, overhauled. They should look that pretty when we get, in, get done overhauling them. They should, should look like new. Uh, what's Gary say here? In addition, the corrosion cracks can be prevalent. Yeah, that's what we're talking about. The bead area is where, where we have a lot of cracks. There you go. That's where the cracks start. So right underneath in that bead area was where there was a crack. And then you can see here's the broken part laying here on the floor. That's right where they crack. That's where the tires really, because when you inflate the tire, it pushes out against this bead. And then when you're stopping, you know, there's a lot of contact area here. So I think there's some metal fatigue going on there. Okay, here, what are they showing us here? They've got us zoomed in down here at the bottom corner. Oh, there's a crack. Yeah, there's a crack across these lugs. Let me zoom in here. Oops. Yeah, we've cracked across these lugs. Wow, I've never seen that before. That's interesting. I'm always interested in how things fail. When I see broken parts, I'm always like, well, what was going on? Why did that break there? Was there material moving? Was there flexing of the steel, flexing of the aluminum? This is a Goodyear wheel break. And the reason I know it's a Goodyear is because a Goodyear has these teeth that are in the, but we can see there's, looks like there's maybe some corrosion going on there, but we've cracked and we've cracked from the bolt hole. When you drill a hole in metal and you make a bolt hole, you have less material here and you have a, stress riser and so it cracked from it probably started there and it cracked its way towards the hole and there was it wasn't as rigid there so okay uh in here the slide talks about using eddy current eddy current is a is a way that they inspect a lot of wheels this is a brake disc area and so any of these places there's a couple of different places where we're really going to look for things here's a tie bolt inspection so, whoops. The easiest thing to do is to go around here and look at all these tie bolts. So when I worked at the airline, the airplane would come into the gate, they'd shut down the engines, they'd dump all the cargo out of it, the crew would go away, we would check the engine oil, we'd do a, a walk around, we'd walk around, the, look at the wings, we'd look at the, the, the wheels, and every time I took my flashlight and I would shine my flashlight and I would shine it on each one of these bolts. And every time an airplane came in, I looked at those bolts. And one night I had a DC-9 that was missing a tie bolt. And I said, hey boss, we got a tie bolt missing. And my, my crew chief said, hey, that was a really good find. I said, I look at him all the time. When I worked corporate, we had, we had one break a tie bolt and I always look at the tie bolts. That's one of the easiest things to inspect. And that's what was broke on my motor glider, was a tie bolt. So anyway, those things take a lot of, a lot of abuse. And if you just look at these things and look at them where you expect them to fail, sooner or later you'll find one that fails there. So, okay, they talk about mag particle inspection, things like that. Sometimes there'll be a crack in a bolt, and, but the bolt hasn't broken yet. So when they take this thing apart, that's why you do non-destructive testing on stuff, is to find stuff before it fails all the way. Okay, now they say this is with the wheel off the airplane, you're gonna inspect these keyways, these slot lugs and screws, because they're under a lot of stress. And the fusible plugs. Fusible plugs, usually my experience with fusible plugs, either they get hot and they blow, or they, they last forever. Now they take them off a lot. Some of these have O-rings on them. If you look here, they've got under this, there's an O-ring. So they'll take them off, clean them, replace the O-ring, inspect it when it's in the wheel and brake shop. Uh, a lot of words is pretty much what I said. Uh, what'd they say? Oh, balance weights. The bigger wheels will have balance weights. They'll be balanced like a tire. And so we inspect those to make sure they're in place. So the wheel shop will balance, balance the tire. There's some of these that are tape on. I hate the tape on, but they, they work okay. So 
we're going to balance the wheel just like we had that prop balancer. Q was in my, in my props class. Um, yes, sir. Yep, just like a prop, put it on there and balance it, put some weights on it. There's a bubble level, there's, there's a, a top, couple of different static balance methods. That's one of them. Uh, there's a, a spin up. If you look at a tire shop, they have a spin up. That's a dynamic balancer. Uh, some people balance airplane wheels that way, and you can. A lot of the same picture here. A lot of cues in here for the instructor to talk about certain things, make sure I cover it all. That's about it. I think we're about to put this seven, yeah, we're putting this 76 slide slideshow to bed. Yeah, here's a couple of balance weights here. Almost looks like there's a scratch or something coming off that, they, almost like a crack, but I think it's just a crack in the paint. Okay, you guys got any questions on, um, got any questions on wheels? No, sir. Okay, well, I don't see anything from Kelly. So uh, it's uh, 40 minutes after, let's take about five minutes. I'll grab my, I'll grab my broken axle. We're gonna come back and what are we gonna talk about? We're gonna talk about, um, Got a PowerPoint on brake actuation systems. And then after that, we're gonna re review for the final exam. And, uh, oh, and we're gonna do the, it's a little bit longer today just because we got the final exam in here. But we'll do the, we'll go over your labs and we'll get it so you guys can get those most of the way done. So 41 after, let's be back at 46 after five minutes. Sound good? Yep. Good to go. All right, Q, I think Kelly may be away for just a minute. Here's this, here's this axle. So there you can see it. Yeah. Now there's where it broke. Here's the other piece. And if you look, it broke right where the, right where the threads start. Now the other thing you'll notice is it's a hollow shaft. And so the axle that I'm going to replace, this is on an experimental airplane. So I don't think this would happen on a factory airplane because I don't think they would have put that, that measly of a, of a uh, axle. Yeah, I thought drive axles are usually solid. Yeah, well with airplanes, you're always worried about weight. Right, right. You want to keep true. the weight down. But True. you can see that the right where the threads start. So, so there was a bearing there. There was a bearing somewhere around where my finger is. So when this yeah. airplane's landing, it's flexing. Right, right. Because it was where it was held. It was held out here by the outer edges. And the wheel was in the center. So every time you land, you're doing this. So yeah. That's metal fatigue. And the yeah. other thing is, the place where it broke was right where the threads end. And if you yeah. look at the depth of the thread, if you look at how much shiny metal and how much dull metal we have. That kind of gives you an idea how much metal, and you can also tell how long it's been doing it based on the shininess. Yeah. So it was, it was an accident waiting to happen. Luckily it right. happened in the I hangar. Yeah, that would have been awful if you were like landing and it broke like that. Well, that airplane, it would have, that airplane's a very slow airplane, slow flying airplane, so it wouldn't have hurt it too bad. It would have ground the gear and it would have closed the runway and they probably would have had to come out and jack it up and put a dolly under it and tow it back to the hangar. And it would have been a big hassle for everybody involved. They probably would have had to shut the airport down. For, would they have to call the FAA for something like that? Probably not. Probably not. If there's no injuries and I don't know, and there's, I don't know, there's a, there's a, it's like it being in a car wreck. There's some, there's some guidelines. A lot of times the airport will just call the, call the feds anyway. And that really, that it always, it just, complicates. yeah, exactly. Complicates it. That's the best word for it. Yeah. So, Okay, so I'm gonna go into the second group so we can uh, 
So we'll get out here a decent time and we're gonna look at brake actuating systems. The other PowerPoint. And it's on the same reading. Let me make that just a hair smaller. There we go, that's better, okay. Okay, so first thing is, is we can boost the pressure of brakes. So if we can't develop enough brake pressure, we'll put a boosting system in there. And a boosting system, if you remember back uh, when we were doing the, the hydraulic section, and I had this problem where we had a large piston and a smaller piston, and if we put in a certain amount of force and the piston area was this much, what would be the output force? That's a brake yeah. booster. That's a brake booster, and that's why they have you do that problem. Now here, this is, I guess this is a boosted brake cylinder, and I don't know really how. Um, I think that this piston, it's, the, it's, a, it's a idea of the different areas of the piston here. A boosted brake master cylinder is mechanically attached to the rudder pedals but the boosted brake cylinder operates differently. So I'm trying to look here. What makes that? That makes no sense. <laughs> it doesn't. I don't see. Uh... Well, your car has a, has a brake booster. When you push on the brakes, if you lift up the hood, you've got where the, you've got the brake master cylinder. And then right, right behind it, there's this big drum. Right. That's that's a brake booster. booster. Right. Yep. So, so I guess that's true. When you push on the brake, you're running the booster. You're not actually running the, the master cylinder, I guess. You're active. I don't know. So anyway, boosters, the way boosters work is that you have a difference in, in area size. Let's see. When brakes are applied, the pilot's foot through a mechanical link, which moves the master cylinder to force the brakes. The initial, okay, too much Gary words. We're gonna, I'm gonna have to move on. You got the basic idea. If you're working on something like this, you're gonna go in here, you're gonna replace the O-rings. You're gonna adjust it. If there's up here where it says toggle, there may be an adjustment and you're gonna follow the maintenance manual. I mean, you know, it's, um, all right, I'm gonna get, yeah, here's power brakes. Large and high performance aircraft, power brakes. Okay, here they're showing us a, um, got the pilot's pedal and we got cables that come back to, let me get my annotation stuff on here. Let me get my flashlight, I like my flashlight. Okay, so we got these cables that go back here and we've got this normal brake metering valve and an alternate brake metering valve, that's gonna be a backup system, and that's gonna put hydraulic fluid down here. And it doesn't really show us how it boosts it, but it does have some cables and some mechanical leverage. I guess if you look at these arrows, that you can have mechanical leverage there. Now, if you take an airplane like my little antique, uh, or my little uh, motor glider, uh, it doesn't have a whole lot of boosting mechanism, but it depends on the size of your cylinder. It's just like when I was talking, we were talking about in hydraulics, force times area, uh, uh, a force equals, pressure times area equals force. So we said, if you want to pick up something big, get a big cylinder. You know, you have a, a cylinder on a bulldozer, it's great big. Uh, a cylinder on a, that opens the door is going to be small, right? So it's all a matter of area and force. See what do they say here. The takeaways are graduated brake control. Power brakes have graduated brake control because we don't want to slam on brakes. When you have mechanical advantage, you need to have some kind of way that you can feel how much force you're putting on. So there's a, a, what they call a brake feel system that will be incorporated in some of these. Uh, talks about anti skid. We talked about anti skid a little bit. Big airplanes have anti skid. Now, hydraulic fuse. Let's go back and look at this. So here they're showing us anti-skid valves. And what that anti-skid valve is going to do is if this wheel gets into a skid, locks up, we're in a skid, it'll open the valve, release the brake pressure, let the wheel get rolling again, then, then start closing it again. 
Okay, there's a shuttle valve here. Why do we have a shuttle valve? Because we have an alternate system. We have a backup system. Over here on the right, they say fuse. See this fuse? Okay, so what happens when, I said this a couple times, we run over a fox and the fox wipes out our brake hoses on this. We start dumping our hydraulic fluid overboard. The fuse says, hey, wait a minute, the brake should only take one gallon of, one gallon of hydraulic fluid and it's, it's dumped out five gallons. It will close and put a tourniquet on the bleeding. And now you don't lose all your hydraulics. So that's a brake fuse. That's what a brake fuse does. Pretty important component, especially when you got wheels and brakes and they're running over all kinds of stuff, hitting rocks and whatever's laying on the runway. Hydraulic fuses are also found in power brake system. You know, that's where you really need them. Hostile environment around the landing gear increases the potential for a line to break. Okay, those are brake fuses. So that's explaining what I just talked about. Okay, here we have another schematic we're looking at. And here we're showing, here he's showing some power brake systems. These are very simplified block diagrams here. So we have uh, brake pressure coming in here. We've got a check valve and an accumulator. Okay, so we can store some, some extra hydraulic fluid for, for a rainy day. When we really need a lot of fluid flow, we got a, a brake accumulator that can give us extra flow. Here's our power brake control valves, and then we've got anti-skids. So if the wheel gets in a skid, that'll release pressure, let the wheel get rolling again. Shuttle valve, the shuttle valve is going to select either the emergency system or the primary system. And here we have a brake blowdown bottle, or we have an emergency brake bottle. So this is, a high, this is usually a nitrogen cylinder. And when we blow the emergency brakes, it'll come over here, it'll make the shuttle valve close, and it will send, it will move the shuttle valve to block off the main pressure side and my emergency will move that brake right up through the line like that, actuate my brake. Now you have a lab sheet today that's going to ask you some questions about, it's gonna show you a schematic similar to this and ask you some questions. So that kind of gets us up for that. Brake control valve, brake metering valve. Okay, key element is a brake control valve, sometimes called the brake metering valve. It responds to brake pedal input by directing aircraft system fluid to the brakes. I'm reading, I'll do that occasionally. As pressure is increased on the brake pedal, more fluid is directed to the brake, causing a higher pressure and greater braking action. So we need to be able to control how much fluid is going to the brakes, we want to either brake gently or brake hard, right? And so we have to have a system that allows us to do that. This is a cutaway of a very expensive, fancy valve. This has what they call a spool in it. And here's the spools. These, this is, there's two spools. This is called a spool. And this is called a spool. And so what this thing's going to do without getting too complex, is that it's going to allow you to shift. Looks like you have an A system pressure and a B system pressure. So imagine your right engine has a hydraulic pump on it, number one engine. Number one jet engine has a hydraulic pump. Your number two jet engine has a hydraulic pump. So we got two sources, and then we can meter between these two sources how much fluid we want to go to the brake. Whole bunch of fancy things this will do. If you work in the Accessory shop, you might be the guy that works on these, and half the time you you'll be working on this, just the same same stuff over and over. Pretty complicated, and I have a feeling that if you wanted to spend a lot of time, you could learn how that. Okay, so there's the two sources I was talking about. I just kind of looked through these words to make sure I talked about everything that was in it. People doing uh, the just doing this, not coming to this lecture, they can read these things and hopefully get part of what I'm saying. Here's a big system. I don't think I'm gonna spend a whole lot of time on it, but, but the, when I look at a, a chart like this, and it looks so confusing, 
the first thing I look at is I start usually at the top and see where they are. They have a, a B system and an A system, and these are pressure lines. And let's look at these colors. There's a system return, that's one color. There's a system pressure and a brake pressure. Brake pressure looks like it's red. And then I'll go around here and I'll start looking at my different components. Okay, here's a main landing gear up line, an automatic wheel snubbing. There's brakes on. I have an accumulator over here. So I just go around here and start identifying these different components. So this schematic would take me about 10 minutes to look at and try to get my bearings on. Down here at the bottom, here's the wheels. Right above it looks like we got an anti-skid valve. And then up here we got some, some um, I guess these are shuttle valves. Yeah, over here on the right, those, that's a shuttle valve with the ball. It looked kind of like a check valve having a ball like that, but, but seeing how it could go over to one side or over to the other side, that's what made me think that was a shuttle valve. So anyway, here's a, this is typical of what I've seen on the corporate jets, this type of schematic. Okay, here's another picture of this valve. I'm skipping through that. I guess the takeaway, what I'd like you guys to know about these brakes is that we have these, these brake control systems that on a big airplane you're operating with a lot of power and you're operating with a lot of of uh, hydraulic fluid at your disposal when you're sitting up in the cockpit and you're 110 feet away from your wheel brakes you can't feel when you push on the brakes you're running a hydraulic valve you can't feel it like you can when you have a cable brake on a on a little Piper tripacer. So these have to have feedback systems and these valves are complicated valves. These mirroring valves are complicated valves that will give you feedback and can also um, um, regulate the amount of braking pressure. That's the takeaway. So yeah, I'm not going to go into all the mechanical details. We could, there's a brake augmentation system and what it does is it makes it so that you can kind of feel how much brake pressure you're applying. It's all pretend land. The purpose of this valve is to put force on the pilot's pedals. So if he's braking hard, he, he feels like he's braking hard. He can feel resistance on those pedals. That's the only thing that this valve does. It's, it's just a, it's a pretend, it's a pretend valve. It's all make-believe but the pilot feels like he's really making those brakes work hard. But this, this actual valve's fighting him is what it's doing. So that's a brake aug aug augmentation valve. But it's, it's a feedback system. So on really big airplanes, you've got to have some kind of feedback because otherwise the pilot has no idea if he's braking hard or he's, you know, he's pushing on the thing. He says, well, this isn't stopping. And so he's pushing harder and harder. Next thing you know, the, the anti-skids, are ratcheting on, off, on, off, on, off, because this guy's got his feet to the floor and the airplane's doing its best to stop, but he doesn't think it's doing anything. So that's why we have feedback. Brake metering valves not only receive hydraulic pressure from two systems, they also have two separate brake assemblies. Okay, so, so yeah, we talked about that, I think, last week. Let me say it again, because it's easy to forget this stuff, especially after I've slept. Um, so each one of these brakes, had on a big airplane, I'm talking 767, 777, they have a whole bunch of brake pucks that push these plates closed and they have around them, there may be 10 of these little pucks. They're squeezing on this multi-rotor brake system. You have A pucks and B pucks. So you have an A hydraulic system, usually your number one engine. You have a B hydraulic engine, uh, hydraulic system, usually your number two. So we have two separate hydraulic systems. If one system fails, we've got a backup brake system. If one set of brake pucks fails, we have the A pucks and the B pucks. So we have two complete systems and then usually on top of that, an emergency system. Because nobody likes landing at 200 miles an hour and running the airplane off the end of the runway. Also, there's enough hydraulic fluid so uh, there's usually a standpipe in the accumulator. We talked about that. 
so that you, if you had uh, a hydraulic leak in flight, you would still have enough left for your brakes. But if you don't, usually you got the nitrogen, the emergency bottle. Okay, those are the backup systems. A lot of slides of words. Okay, let's see what this slide's showing us. Okay, they're showing us the different system. Here's a, they're showing us the B system accumulator, which would mean that someplace on the airplane is an A system accumulator. Okay, and when you work on, if you're working down at FEM or you're working at uh, United Airlines or wherever, uh, this is one of the things you go and check as a mechanic. Uh, when the airplane lands and I do my walk around inspection, I go up and I look at all these accumulator pre-charges. Now what happens if, if this thing reads zero? Is that normal? Should I read zero on this? No. Nope. Remember the black? You have some kind of pressure on it. Right? Yep. Yeah, you, should, you, have, you have to have that pre-charge. Yeah. Or else you won't have anything to uh, back it up when the uh, original A system, I guess, runs out. Or is oh, that's under right. a lot of pressure. That's right. And if you also remember, we had that test question about reading zero. And that was usually an indication of a broken, uh, a broken membrane, a broken um, diaphragm. Bladder. Yeah, Bladder. diaphragm. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So when this thing is at pressure, when we got the hydraulic pumps on and we're pumping pressure in this system, I should read 3000 PSI. That's what the pump's putting out. When we shut the airplane down and those pumps go away, I should read what the pre-charge is. And so we would read these between flights. The airplane would be shut down. They'd be unloading the freight. We'd walk up in here and we'd look at the charge. But if, if we were troubleshooting an airplane, now this is in a wheel well, so if you're running the gear, it's not safe to be in here. But if you're someplace where you're running, you know, if you're on the ground and that gear's down and locked, you got safety pins in there, you're running the flap system, you want to read the hydraulic pressure, you can come down and read it right on this valve. That's going to show you, because remember I said that that accumulator is a push of war. So I've got pre-charge on this side, but once I turn on that pump, the two are going to push against each other. And because one side is nitrogen, the nitrogen is going to come to, it's going to compress till it equals what the pressure is on the hydraulic side. A little bit of review there. Okay, parking brakes. Usually what parking brakes do on the big airplanes is you put pressure on there and it, it just locks the, uh, locks the a valve so the pressure is applied. The mechanical ones are like like parking like a parking brake on a car. There's a ratcheting sound and all that stuff. Uh, I guess I guess these handles have a ratcheting sound on them too. They they make them this one here, this one here is just a, a lever. It's just a lever you throw. So this is a big airplane. This is probably something like a 7.6, I'm guessing. Looking at the flight management system, all that, I'm guessing this is about a, a 757 or a 767 vintage airplane. Brake D boosters. Okay, sometimes you have brake systems that, you, that they don't operate on 3000 PSI. Maybe it operates on 1200 PSI. So we do the same thing. That, that two piston thing that we drew, that weird thing, we can deboost as easy as we can boost. And there are brake D booster systems. And I think there's some test questions on D-booster systems. I don't know what there is to know about them. You can do the theory. We did the theory back in the hydraulics section. Here's a brake D-booster and it's mounted on the side of the landing gear strut. So that's just gonna knock the pressure down. Uh, simple devices that use an application of force on different size pistons. Pressure equals force divided by area. So anyway, that's just that triangle. I start with force equals pressure times area. And I put F on the top of my triangle and PA on the bottom. And then you can just sort out whether what's divided by what. Okay. This is, um, I think this is a D booster. You've got a piston area on the top of one square inch, and you got a piston area on the bottom of five square inches. So what do they got? They got 300 PSI on the big side and 1500 PSI on the small side. That's gonna take that amount of fluid, it's gonna knock it down. 
that was that was that exact problem we did. Okay, yep. Same thing, same thing, same thing. Uh, ball resets the piss and travel. Okay, so it, uh, yeah, they're going a little deeper than what I would normally go on that. Okay, so there we go. We got that done. So what we got left on here is a little bit of review, I think. Let me look and see what I've got on here. So we did brakes. What's this? Ah, hydraulics and pneumatics. Okay, so let me see. We took a break. It's been. A, we can go for a little while. You guys go for a little while longer, can't you? Yeah, I'm good to go. Okay, because if we need to break, take a break, you can just tell me. I think I got about another 20 minutes left. Well, we got a little longer than that. Let's. I'll tell you what. Let's do labs. Let's do labs, and we'll take a break, and then we'll finish it up. You got it. All right, so um, I'm gonna pull up lab 29H2. So if you guys wanna take a minute, grab a piece of paper, or if you've got it online and you wanna switch, you wanna open up that file, 29H2, it's on this week, COVID week six, down at the bottom, and it's okay, called emergency break. With the schematic on it. Yeah, so let me make sure. I, I'm not sure I'm sharing. I don't think I am. Get rid of that and share screen. And here it is here. Okay, it looks like this. Okay, you ready, Q? Yes, sir. Okay, so we're looking at this schematic. Let's. Let's see if we can make sense out of this. Over here on the left-hand side, let me get my, let me get my, uh, my flashlight turned on. Okay, over here on the left, I'm showing some electrical things. This is showing us the bus that powers the electrical indication system. I got some warning lights, right? Okay, now just above that, I've got pilot's master cylinder left and right. So this is where the pilot puts his feet for the brakes. So this is a feet on the brakes kind of brake system. Over here, just to the right of that, the co-pilot's got the same thing. Now it looks like over here, I've got a reservoir. That's a funny looking reservoir. It looks like it's got a couple of knobs. It looks like a, I don't know what it looks like, but that's, a, that's supposed to be a reservoir. Then over to the right of it, I've got a pump. Just before that, I got accumulator, charge valve, and accumulator. Now let's go down a little bit. And I'm gonna start at the bottom now and work, let's work our way up. Down at the bottom here, we got an anti-skid control box. That looks like it's hooked to electrical stuff. I've got a wheel generator. So my electrical system, the the line for the wires running into the wheel generator. Looks like I got a couple tires here. That's pretty easy to see. I've got the different colors, supply and return of my fluids. Then let's start at this left tire. Coming up from it, it looks like our line goes up to a parking brake and then to a anti-skid and power brake. So it looks like Uh, it looks like this hydraulic fluid from these master cylinders is going to go through down to this power brake system and this is gonna boost it, is my guess. And then we've got pump supply and the, the pump here is going to give me probably boosted hydraulic pressure. Now over to the right, I've got the landing gear lever in the horn and it's showing me what it looks like in the cockpit and right below that I've got a schematic for landing gear switch. Now look right below that, emergency gear brake air bottle. And then there's a valve it looks like. 
and that valve looks like it's closed right now. And there's a little knob, like a red knob on that, okay? So, so what we can deduce from this, what we've seen here just by taking a little look at each, all, each of the components, is that we've got a pilot system where pilots are gonna put their feet on the pedals, and when they push on the pedals, there's gonna be a brake booster. So it's gonna have a higher pressure going to the wheels. I can see there's also an anti-skid system on this airplane. And I can see there's an emergency brake system on this airplane. Makes sense? Okay, so the first question, list components in the emergency brake system. There you go, Q, we got them, huh? <laughs> I mean, we got uh, an anti-skid. Yep, we got a boost, uh, a, a, a booster, brake booster system. We got an emergency bottle. Yeah, anti-skid, power brake, emergency bottle, a reservoir, an accumulator. I'm telling you, there's nothing like having your your uh, instructor working with you on the on the lab sheet, huh? Yes, sir. We got pilot you know, and co-pilot master brakes on there. Yep. Yep. Yeah, there's some other stuff in there, depending on how deep you want to go. There's a pressure indicator and a accumulator and a relief valve. And then we're kind of running out of stuff. Number two, how does the flight crew regulate brake pressure when using the emergency brake system? Well, for one thing, you got an you got an anti skid system. So if you really over if you if you get to where you lock those brakes up, the anti skid is going to regulate part of that for you. Now this power brake system, it's going to provide some regulation. Because if you look, there's a motor switch. There's a 900 psi and a 1300 psi switch. Yeah, I saw that. So you say, did you say the pressure? Warning switch. The power the power brake system has a has a motor switch. And there's also uh it looks like that's connected electrically into the landing gear control switch. And it looks like there's also a pressure warning switch. Of course, that's just warning. That's not regulating it. That's just telling the pilots, warning. So what is it? Is it asking what happens? Oh, okay, no, it says, how does the flight crew regulate brake pressure? Um, well, Without re, you know, they didn't give us any more reading. There might be some kind of feedback system, but if there's not, you know, if you can't feel it, and this thing is doing a mechanical multiplication, then the only thing you really got is you got an anti skid box, and whatever the power brake's going to do. But really, if you think about it, with these big airplanes, you want them to stop as usually as fast as you as they can you can let off the brakes if it's stopping too fast but but once you go into a skid or you're close to a skid the anti the anti skid is going to take care of it for you so pilots when they right. when they land these big airplanes they go for max braking they they push down on those pedals and what's making the airplane what's regulating the airplane is really the anti skid it's doing maximum braking and then releasing the when the wheel starts to lock up, like releasing it. Like an ABS on a car. Mm hmm Same thing, you're going 80 miles an hour, you push that brake to the floor as hard as you can, 
And he goes, rrr, 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 rrr. yeah, we had we had Andy Skid before the car guys did. Really? We were Andy Skid before Andy Skid was cool. <laughs> Uh, does the pilot have differential braking when using the emergency brake system? Let's look at that. So over on the right is the emergency brake. Does the emergency brake have a left and right capability? Um, no. Look at the line. No, it just goes to the brakes. It's stupid. It is a stupid system that's going to save your ass. Okay, so the answer is no. Nope, it's just gonna apply both brakes. And if, if you go, if, if the pilots have to use the emergency brake system like that, they stop on the runway, they close the runway down, they call maintenance, you come out with a, a tug and a tow bar and you tow that airplane back to the gate. Because if they had to use that emergency brake system, they, that airplane is not safe to taxi. Right. I'll tell you a little story. Uh, I always think it's a funny story. Delta Airlines had a 757. A guy was taxiing it. And when you taxi, uh, you turn the anti-skid off. Because if the airplane, if, the, if you're going real slow, the anti-skid system will tell, will think that the wheel is locked up. So if you're going like just barely creeping, Andy right. Skid says, hey, we're about to go into a skid, so it releases brake pressure. So you push on the brakes, the Andy Skid doesn't do anything. So, so you have a checklist, and, and when you get run up and, quali and taxi qualified, you know, there's, there's usually two mechanics in an airplane, and you're both qualified. You've been in the flight simulator. You went to school for a week to be taxi qualified. So when you taxi, you follow the checklist. Well, okay. It happens, people don't follow the checklist. So a guy was taxing a 757 up to the hangar at Delta. This is in Hartsfield, Atlanta. This is probably in 19, 1986. And he, he had, they had, him and another guy were taxing, they had the anti-skid was turned on. So they come creeping up to the hangar doors there at Delta. You've probably seen them if you've ever flown in Atlanta and looked at the maintenance shops. And when they went to hit the brakes, the airplane didn't stop. And the airplane ran into the hangar doors. And uh, as the airplane was, he was trying to stop the airplane, he was like, oh, crap. So he threw on the thrust reversers. And the thrust reversers, you know, it takes a while for a jet engine to spool up. So when they finally spool up, now it backs away and it gets rolling too fast backwards. So he hits the brakes again, still doesn't have any brakes, still doesn't hit the emergency bottle. He hits the, the thrust reversers, he, he stows the reversers and bumps the throttles back forward. The airplane comes back forward, he hits the brakes, he's heading for the doors again, he hits the brakes, the brakes don't do anything because the anti-skid's turned on and he's still creeping and he runs into the doors a second time. Oh my goodness. Puts it in reverse, backs it up, somebody throws some chocks under the airplane. Hit the doors <laughs> twice. That's ridiculous. Didn't follow I the checklist, the had the anti-skid on. So that tells you how anti-skids work. Um, question three, does the pilot have differential braking when using that? That's a no. What is differential braking? Did you see Kelly's question? Oh, no, I didn't. I'm sharing a screen. Let me see if I can. I'm not as good with this as I am with Blackboard Collaborate. Um, I can read it. Yeah, read it to me. I'm I'm struggling this morning. What What are the What are the green lines coming out of the power brake in the anti skid box going to the wheel separate? What are the green lines? Okay. Yeah, coming out of the coming out of the anti skid box and the power brake.
Okay, these on the left, I'm colorblind, but I think what he's talking about is, is these lines here, these lines here. Those no, are hydraulic green. lines. No, 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 no. Oh, to the right? Yeah, okay, so you got the power brake and the anti-skid valve. Yep, this is, is hydraulic fluid going to the brakes, and that's at, that's at full system pressure. That's probably 3,000 PSI. Then this, these lines, this is a servo valve that's connected to the anti-skid. So these guys are working together, boosting, boosting pressure and releasing pressure. And then here we have a uh, motor switch, which is connected to the extend and retract switch in the gear. And that's going up to the pump. And what that guy is doing is he's sensing pressure. And that's the anti-skid on and off valve. So the big ones are hydraulic lines. The small ones are electrical wires. Up going, uh, oh, okay, I see. The, the one coming out of the top. Let me scroll up a little bit where I can see it. Oh, that's hydraulic fluid coming from the reservoir. That's what's up top. So here we've got, here we've got a reservoir and the reservoir supplying hydraulic fluid to this power brake. Okay, this is a low pressure coming from the pilots. This is a boosted pressure going to the brake. And then this is a supply line from the hydraulic cylinder. Okay. Now let's go down and see why well, I made mince meat of that. Of that, uh, let's do that, and let's go down if we can. Up. Oh. Let me erase this. There we go. Okay, um, <laughs> man, this thing, I'm not doing too good. At I hit eraser, but I think I got to erase. Oh, here it is, clear, clear, clear all drawings. Okay, all right. Um, so does the pilot have differential braking when using a no? And what is differential braking? You know what differential braking is? I guess it's the separation of, basically, I guess, uh, you got both wheels or both sides, like the left and right. So it's separating the amount of hydraulic pressure to each side, or each wheel of the aircraft side. Yeah. You hit the left brake, the left brakes. You hit the right brake, the right brakes. You can turn the airplane. So if I'm taxing right. the airplane, I step on the right brake and I don't step on the left, I can make the airplane turn to the right. I can steer the airplane with the brakes. Now, um, my airplane, you can do that. Uh, that little, that little two-seat airplane, that two-seat airplane that I fly in, the Kiss, it has differential braking, so I can steer the airplane with the brakes. And the nose wheel is not connected to the rudder pedals. That's on a swivel. But there's some airplanes, like a tail dragger. You take those airplanes, they fly in like uh, Flying Wild Alaska. Uh, they steer them with the brakes. So that's differential braking. But if I hit the right brake, makes the airplane want to turn right. If I hit the left brake, makes the airplane want to turn left. So number five, why does the pilot lose anti-skid protection when using the emergency brake system? Well, let's go up and look at that. Okay, so if you hit the emergency brake, I got my bottle here, right? If I hit the emergency brake, that's gonna supply fluid down through this line to both brakes, and they're gonna brake. So I've kind of chopped off the uh, anti-skid. The anti-skid, where it's going to release pressure is gonna be up in here. This is what's connected to the fluid side.
So the, so the emergency lost. the emergency is going to cut that off, and there's probably like a shuttle valve or something like that. That's there's a breaking park valve between that, but there's there should be some kind of shuttle, uh, some kind of valve. Because your anti skid's not going to. If you got to go to emergency brakes, your your anti skid is going to be bypassed. So, why does the pilot lose the anti skid? Because you're in an emergency situation, I guess. Well, no, because the emergency brake is downstream, and it's now controlling the brakes. The the emergency the emergency brake system is is supplying all the pressure to the brakes and the anti-skid is up here in the hydraulic system they're not showing a shuttle valve there's got to be a shuttle valve in here but when you go to the emergency brake it's going to cut off the hydraulic system the hydraulics from the brakes Okay. All right. Well, let's jump over and let's take a look at our next. Um, let me get rid of any clear of that. Let's look at our next. Um, our next lab. This is the last of the labs. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. So share screen. And, and I got a lot of stuff open right now. Here we go. 29i, brake system malfunctions. Okay. A couple of these I don't remember right away. So the answer to this is all in the reading. But let's see if we can kind of work out what some of these brake system problems would be. Uh, what would be some of the causes of fading brakes? Why do you think brakes would fade? Uh, from too much use. Too much use. Fade. Fade. Uh, so, you ever have a you ever have a car that had bad brakes, and you found like if you pumped it, you pump the brakes that the brakes will work, but then pretty soon they'll they'll kind of bleed down. You ever do that where you had a, yeah. an old car, you pump the brakes? Yeah. What, what's that usually a sign of? You don't have enough brake, uh, hydraulic fluid or hydraulic pressure. Not enough, yeah, that's one, that's okay. So there's one of your answers. Not enough hydraulic fluid. If you had a leak in the system, if you have air getting in the system, that would cause, um, cause that same thing. Uh, let me look here. I've got this. I'm going to open up this um, 8083. Let me, yeah, I think I got that open. Let me stop sharing that. The next question, what's the next question on there? The next question is, what are some of the factors that result in excess brake travel? The next one is what will result in grabbing brakes? So let's do this. If I pull up, let me do another share. Oops, I didn't want that one. I wanted a different one. Stop share. I want the one on landing gear. I guess this is sharing all of it. Our brakes. Oops, that's landing gear pool. Ah, I don't have my chapter up on that. Let me get it. So I'm opening the chapter on landing gear right now. And what I was planning on doing was just doing a search. Let's 
Let's try something here. Okay, now I got it. Sorry about this, still a little clunky. Share screen, okay, now we're going to do this. Okay, so here's landing gear. So one of the things we can do is we can say fine, and let's type in spongy. Spongy breaks. And it's looking 104 pages in this section and see if it has the word spongy in here. What do you, um, have you ever had spongy breaks? Same, same basic thing. Um, kind of a fading, I would think. Oh, here you go. This is on page 46. So I just searched, basically searched that. And it says, um, breaking action for it should be equal. Pedal should be firm, not soft or spongy. Um, I wonder if there's a next. Okay, here you go, right here. We found it, Q. Yes, sir. So, trying to get my annotation up. When brakes are applied, okay, since air is compressible and hydraulic fluid is not, any air under pressure when the brakes are applied causes spongy brakes. So spongy brakes comes from air in the system. Now, one of the other thing was, clear this, clear all drawings, get rid of that. Uh, it said grabbing, brakes grabbing. Let's look for that. Oh, nothing found. It's probably in this section here. What would make brakes grab? I assume that's like grabbing as in too much. Yeah, jerking and, and, and not releasing like they should. Okay, see this picture I've got up here? Yeah. Master cylinder. See that spring? Yeah. So when you let off the brake, the spring's supposed to move it back. Okay, what All if right. something's wrong with that spring? It breaks or you got contamination in there and that spring jams? It's gonna. So, cause so it would be like a master cylinder problem, it looks to me like. Or it could be a puck, it could be something jamming in the brake. A brake piston. Yeah, four was described how air will cause a spongy break. Air is compressible, right? That's why. What conditions cause dragging break? So a dragging break would be that either the puck can't retract or those the springs on the master cylinder can't retract. So it's usually from contamination. Maybe it's got a bunch of gunk all over it. It's all covered with grease and sticky 5606 hydraulic fluid. From hydraulic fluid contamination. Yep. Yeah, if it gets all sticky and now you got dirt sticking up in there and all kinds of grass and <laughs> uh, wheel brakes, you know, that's what they get. They get dirt, grass, snow, hydraulic fluid. Right. Uh, seven, if an emergency air pressure has been used to stop an airplane, how are brakes released so that the airplane may be moved? How would you get the emergency air pressure off if you pull that handle and you release that bottle? Say that one more time. 
Question number seven says, if emergency air pressure has been used to stop the airplane, how are the brakes released? How would you get that air pressure out? You might have to crack a line with a, you yeah. might take a wrench, crack a line. Or, or they may give you some way to bleed that off. Once you I was going to say, like the bleeder valve, the bleeder valve be. on the. Uh, yep. Calibers. Yep, that would work. I'd just probably take a break, uh, uh, a wrench, and crack the crack the nut, let it bleed down. Okay, number eight. I talked about that. What's the purpose of a brake fuse? Uh, condition. Go go ahead, Q. Uh, to to uh, basically to show if there is a loss in fluid. An uh, extreme loss in fluid, and to uh, stop the extreme loss of fluid. That's it. You got it. Okay. What do we got next? How would brake lining be affected by hydraulic fluid? How, how are the brake pads, if you get hydraulic oil on a brake pad, how is that going to affect it? It's going to glaze over and it's not going to stop the, it's not going to be able to stop it. It's a, exactly. Yep. Okay, number 10. What maintenance action must be performed when a brake system is serviced with an incorrect fluid? It happens. Somebody does something incredibly stupid. So my hint is to look at the hydraulics section. So let me see if I can share that. Okay, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to do what I recommended earlier, which is to search for contamination. The book talks about system flushing. Okay, it's this here is talking about wheel bearings and contamination. Let's look for the next instance. Oh, this is landing gear. I'm in landing gear. I wanted, um, what's this one? That's the test pool, what's this one? Here's the one I wanted. Okay, let's search for contamination. This is the chapter 12, hydraulics and pneumatics. Uh, that's not it. That's talking about different phosphate esters, susceptibility to contamination. There's compatibility, contamination, hydraulic fluid contamination. Contamination check. Here's how to do sampling, it looks like. Okay, contamination control. Here's hydraulic system flushing. Okay. So would it make sense that if you put the wrong hydraulic fluid in there that you might have to flush the hydraulic system and put in the correct fluid? Yep. Okay. So they tell you to connect a hydraulic test stand to it. And um, you're probably going to drain out anything that you can get to that you know is bad. Connect a hydraulic test stand, verify the unit's fluid, fluid is clean, change the filters, pump clean filtered fluid through it. I think the first thing you want to do is try to get as much of the, of the wrong fluid out and dispose of it. And then this, so, uh, this is going to get rid of debris. A lot of this flushing is if you have a hydro hydraulic system and you have a valve come apart and it sends metal shards all through the hydraulic system. 
and you say, man, we got metal all through our hydraulic system. Well, you can hook it to a mule with, a, with good filters and you can just run it, run it, run it and, and just suck all that metal out. What were you gonna say, Q? Uh, I don't even know. I'm just <laughs> waiting on, I'm just listening. I don't Trying to keep I'm up, saying. huh? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you need to, what action should be performed? So you got to remove the incorrect fluid from the entire system or flush it? Yep, and then flush it. Okay. Flush the, uh, flush the entire hydraulic system. Yep. And if you want to make a note, if you want to go back and clean up your lab sheet or something like that later, this is page 12 dash five, chapter 12, page okay. five. And I attached it to the assignment. So so on these labs, uh, all our answers are found in these, in these uh, pages. Gotcha. And I think that'll get you pretty close to done. If that doesn't get you done, you'll be darn close. Okay, well, what I'm gonna recommend we do here is let's take a couple minutes. Let's take four or five minutes and then I'll come back and I'll do a review for the final and then we'll be done for today. Sounds good. So it's 47 minutes after, so five minutes from now will be uh, 2.52. You got it. Okay.
Okay. Um, Kelly, I got the chat back up. I don't know what my problem was. I get to doing too many things at once. I get talking and I, they talk about trouble um, multitasking. I definitely don't multitask real well, but I uh, got the chat box up now. So anyway, um, Q, I'm hoping you're back. If not, yeah, it'll take yeah. me a minute to get going here. I'm gonna share I'm my, back. okay, great. I'm gonna share my screen. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go through the, um, just some things that you need to know. Um, so I'm kind of really going back to uh, uh, the very beginning. We start out talking about uh, chapter 12, and we talked about the different types of hydraulic fluid, uh, the phosphate ester, which is Skydraw, and 5606 are the primaries fluids there. Uh, we talked about Pascal's law. Talked a little bit about mineral, but not much. That's pretty much antique airplanes. See what else we've got in here. Health and handling. Basic. We talked about open and closed center hydraulic systems. So you remember what a open center hydraulic system is? We're looking at one right now. Open center hydraulic system. This is it. Fluid can flow through uh, when things aren't moving. Fluid circulates around through an open system. A closed system. So the open system has to have a directional control valve that has a straight through passage port. So that's what it's showing there. Um, the closed center has a valve, directional control valve that has uh, capped off ports in the center. On the schematic, I'm not, I'm not gonna have you guys do hydraulic schematics for final exam. We put that to bed. Uh, that was the first half. It helps a lot to help you guys understand it, but we've kind of been there, done that. So I'm not doing anything. You're not gonna be drawing any schematics and doing those, those schematics like we were earlier on. Um, here is a, uh, uh, I guess you would call this an open center system. There's a selector valve that's three selector valves in parallel and actuating unit. We'll look at some test questions at it as it goes with that. We talked about different hydraulic pumps. There's a hydraulic power pack. A hydraulic power pack is usually a hydraulic pump driven by like an electric motor, or it can be driven by uh, a hydraulic motor. Okay, we talked about reservoirs. The functions of reservoirs, reservoirs cool the hydraulic fluid. They also have a place to store hydraulic fluid. Uh, they'll have a standpipe, which will store a emergency amount of hydraulic fluid. If we look at these, these reservoirs here, we see a standpipe drawn in them. Uh, remember what a rat is, R-A-T? Ran, ran air turbine. Exactly. Yeah, that's your that's your oh Jesus, save me. I'm about to die. We've lost both engines, we've locked lost our utility or electrical system, and we got nothing to fly the airplane. The airplane's dark. You pull the lever, up out pops this little propeller and spins up a hydraulic system that'll run just enough hydraulics to keep you alive. We have pressurized reservoirs and non-pressurized reservoirs. Uh, an airplane like my little airplanes that only go up to about 12,000 feet, I can do it with a non-pressurized hydraulic system. But when I start going up above uh, 18,000, I need a pressurized hydraulic system, right? And then we serviced, we found on the commander where you service the, the pressure in the reservoir. Okay, so we got some pictures of some reservoirs. These fins that they're showing us here on the left, those fins are cooling fins. All right, so one of the functions of a reservoir is to cool it, to cool the hydraulic fluid. Um, there's some temperature and sensors in here. Talked about a lot about hydraulic systems. What was this drawing up here? What are they showing us? Principle behind a fluid pressurized hydraulic reservoir. Okay, so there was the, there was the reservoir that's just a big 
tin can, and then there was the uh, canister type reservoirs. Uh, let me see. We talked about accumulators. Here's filters. We talked about filter size and how many microns of filter pressures or filtering there was. Covered a lot of stuff this semester. Uh, what else we got? Okay, so this was showing you um, uh, a micronic filter is a lot of times 10 microns. A human hair is 100 microns in diameter, so it gave you an idea of the micron size. We had a mesh screen filter. Um, and we had, what was the other type? We'll come across it here in a second, I think. Uh, the FA loves this hand pump. Where's my picture of the hand pump? There's the pan pump. The FA loves this. You will see this on the FA written. The reason they love this illustration is because it shows how check valves work. So we talked about this and how that operated. There's a rotary hand pump that was there in the other picture. Um, constant displacement pump. We talked about constant displacement pumps. So there's a G, G rotor and a gear pump or constant displacement pumps. That's a G rotor pump. You turn that shaft one time, you get one ounce of oil. You turn it two times, you get two ounces of oil. That's a constant displacement pump. This is a variable displacement pressure compensated pump. Usually when I go to variable, variable, variable displacement, I almost always go to variable displacement pressure compensated because that's how they, they make most of these pumps. So I gave the example, we were out in the hangar and we had those buckets of water and we're passing them around. And I said, you're the landing gear and you over there, you're the flaps. So we take off landing gear, landing gear up, flaps up. You guys need hydraulic fluid and we're as much fluid as we could pump down the system. That's a variable displacement pump. Variable displacement pressure compensated. They go hand in hand. The other one was a, was a constant displacement pump. So I can't alter my output. Then there was this pump that was a weird pump called the bent axis pump. And the bent axis pump is a, is a constant displacement pump because it, it's, it looks like a variable displacement, but there's no squash plate. And the squash plate is what allowed us to vary the output of the, of the pump. So this is a bent axis pump. It's got these pistons in here. That is a variable variable uh variable output pump pressure compensated variable, variable displacement the swash plate here on the right the swash plate is what makes that variable okay uh we talked about a star pump a sliding vein pump this is a sliding vein pump these are low pressure pumps uh let me keep going this talks about swash plates and all. We looked at valves, we looked at cylinders. And if you remember a hydraulic cylinder, we calculated the amount of force and it, uh, force equals pressure times area. We use the triangle. And remember that on the one side is called the cap side. The cap side has whatever the diameter of the cylinder is. So if it's a one inch, one inch diameter cylinder, we find the area of that pi r square, and we can calculate the area. Now on the retract, we don't have as much retraction force because we've got a rod in there. And instead of having a round piston that I can very simply calculate the area, I have a donut because that rod is taking up part of that piston, right? So where I might have, have a sonar that extends and gives me 9,000 pounds of extension force, it might only give me 6,000 pounds of retraction force, all right? We did that in class. There's a four-way selector valve. We talked about different selector valves. That's a spool type selector valve. I don't know that you'll see a whole lot on that. We talked about check valves. Here's our check valves and here's a ball check valve. Now we also had a swing check valve, which had a little gate which swung. And then we had an orifice type check valve. And if you look at this picture in the top right, there's a little box there that says drilled passage. That's the orifice check valve. Um, we talked about sequence valves. 
and we talked about shuttle valves. We went out in the hallway and I had some of you guys coming down the hallway one way and you guys, oh, we're gonna blow the shuttle valve. And we blew it one way and only one group could come through. And if the other group came through, it shut off the hallway to the other side. That's a shuttle valve. We did a hillbilly, a Tim hillbilly demonstration of that. We also talked about se sequence valves. Go ahead, Q. No, I was just laughing what you said to hillbilly. <laughs> yeah. Well, all these hillbilly, uh, these hillbilly um, simulations, it helps me keep it straight. It, it makes it very obvious and simple to me when we, when we go through the motions. Yep, this I is, enjoy it. Yeah, well, gets us out, up out of our chairs. It sure will be nice yeah. when we can go back to meeting as a group. Yeah. Kind of miss that. Indeed. Okay, so sequence valve. We went out on a hydraulic bench and you guys made a sequence valve by using a pressure relief valve. Some of these valves are named things like sequence, but they're really something like a pressure relief valve. There's only a couple different types of valves. They're, they just are gonna port fluid. So one way we did it is that you guys plumbed up this system that when, this, when one cylinder got to the end of its travel, this, the pressure kicked up and it made it select pressure to the other cylinder and you sequenced two hydraulic cylinders by using a, basically a pressure relief valve. Over here on the left, this is a mechanical operated sequence valve. This is used like on landing gear doors. When the landing gear door opens, it comes down and a striker hits this valve, that little sign where it says plunger, it hits that and it moves the ball off the seat and lets fluid go to the second port. Those are sequence valves. We also have a priority valve. A priority valve is just another kind of sequence valve. It can be run mechanically, it can be run uh, uh, based on pressures. There's a quick disconnect. There's your hydraulic fuses. We talked about hydraulic fuses early on, but now we got to see them with brakes. Uh, on the right, that's showing us a pressure relief valve. We also had a valve called an unloading valve. And it was kind of like a pressure relief valve, but it, it, it would move a little bit more fluid. This is a spring type shuttle valve here. A little different from our puck style shuttle valve. We talked about those. There's a pressure reducing valve. It's just gonna take a high pressure and knock it down a little bit. Talk to, here's our accumulators. There's our piston accumulator. We talked about what happens if the seal breaks on that. So we have hydraulic fluid separated by nitrogen. I said that bladder, that's like a push of war. When we pump up hydraulic pressure, that nitrogen will compress until it, until it comes to the same pressure that's on the other side. It's a push of war. These guys will equalize. Then if pressure drops on the hydraulic side, going down the runway, flaps up, gear up, climb out, left turn, we're using a lot of hydraulic fluid. We use so much hydraulic fluid, the pressure drops. So now that nitrogen has more pressure than the hydraulic and it pushes fluid into the system. That's how we can store away for a rainy day. Heat exchanger, if our hydraulic fluid gets hot, we run it through a radiator, blow a fan across it. That's a heat exchanger. There's a cylindrical or a piston type accumulator there on the left does the same thing as that, that ball bladder style, a spherical bladder. Actuators, we talked about how actuators work. There was this, there's this weird diagram the FA loves. They put that on the test. That was been on the test since probably about 1950, that, that diagram there. Uh, ram air turbines. I, we talked about hydraulic motors. In fact, you guys plumbed up a motor. A hydraulic motor is just like a, a Hydraulic pump in reverse. And we plumbed one up on the hydraulic test bench. We did that troubleshooting thing. One of the things that we had going was I had a hydraulic motor there going. That was our last, our last project we did on the hydraulic test bench. There's your ram air turbine. Uh, we talked about O-rings. Like a V-ring or a U-ring, you, you install the cup so that the cup will catch the fluid, right? The pressure side. Uh, forces fluid into the U-ring or the cup side of that, the U-cup. Um, 
talked about different types of packings. If you use SkyDraw, you need packings that are either um, uh, I'm trying to remember the word. I'll think of it in a second. It's probably in here. Backup rings are usually made for from Teflon and um, let me see. What do they say about O-rings? They talk about compatibility. I'm having a brain fart right now. So, um, oh, here they show you the correct way to install a backup ring. Backup rings are made of Teflon. Teflon will handle anything. Seal materials. Seals for phosphate ester are butyl rubber or ethylene polypropylene. EP, EPM, I think. Um, okay, and then we talked about some big, big airplane. We talked about how to remove O-rings. You guys did it. That was one of the, one of the labs you guys actually got to do was take apart some hydraulic cylinders, put them back together. We did that. And then we talked about big airplane systems. And that was it until we went into landing gear. Okay, so what I was going to do here next was let's look at a few test questions. And what I've done is I put for the second half, I put 35 test questions and my test pool questions will come out of this. But let's look at number two. Pretty interesting seeing how we just did this lab. What would be the effect if the piston return spring broke in a master cylinder, a brake master cylinder? A, the brakes would become spongy. B, the brake travel would become excessive, or C, the brakes would drag. And that's the answer. What do you know? Um, bleeding brakes, we didn't talk too much about bleeding brakes, but we'll do it when we come back. Uh, bleeding brakes, the process of withdrawing fluid from the system for the purpose of removing air. Withdrawing fluid, I, why do they say withdrawing fluid? Bleeding the brakes means removing any fluid from the system that has air trapped in it. Okay, okay. So there's air bubbles gets in the oil. And so what you do is you pump in new oil and the new oil replaces the old oil that has the air bubbles in it. So you can go through down through here and study these, but I thought I'd go through a couple. To prevent rapid extension of oleo strut after initial compression, Various types of valves or orifices are used which restrict the reverse fluid flow. So when we were doing that section on struts, um, there was some pictures in there. I don't know if I've got that up. I don't think I do. But we had cutaways of that that showed where the oil was in the oleo strut and some of them had um, an orifice. Now, ra rapid extension after initial compression, yeah. Well, you have an orifice. Metering pin gradually reduces the size of the orifice. The metering pin, if you look at the, the picture, that's when the airplane touches down and the strut is compressing. There's a metering pin which reduces the amount of fluid that can escape because what you want to do is you start out when you're taxing, you're riding on air. You guys remember you put air in those struts and you put oil in the struts. So when you're taxing, you're riding around air, but when the airplane hits hard, it's riding on fluid and there's a metering pin which shuts off the transfer of fluid and, and gives you a liquid shock absorption. And it's usually when you're getting close to getting flat because hydraulic fluid is basically incompressible, right? All this stuff's in the reading, so if you get into something and you can't remember, um, the brakes was chapter 13, and, the, uh, and this is all in Blackboard. The pilot reports the right brake on the airplane is spongy. When the pedal is depressed, the probable cause is the master cylinder piston is sticking. Air in the brake hydraulic system. Spongy, remember we said spongy? I guess we're right, huh? Yes, sir. Even a blind squirrel gets a nut now and then, Q. Uh, aside from external leak in a line will cause parking brakes to continu continually bleed off pressure. 
and it's an internal leak in the master cylinder. Uh, it wouldn't be insufficient hydraulic fluid because if you got enough brake pressure to set the brake, it means that you had enough hydraulic fluid, you're gonna trap the fluid once you set the brake. Glazed brake linings, that uh, doesn't make a lot of sense either. All right, I'm gonna look through here and see if there's anything else. See, why do most aircraft manufacturers recommend tubes be inflated, then deflated, then reinflated? To allow the, the tube to position itself correctly inside the tire. What happens is you wad this tube up and you shove it down inside that tire, and then you bolt the brakes together. And when you inflate it, sometimes it's kind of folded or it's not, it's kind of like if you got, I don't know, if you got boxer shorts and tight pants on, you gotta, gotta get it rearranged, right? <laughs> yeah. So, so the answer is to, uh, that you inflate it, then you deflate it, then you reinflate it, and lets the tube work its way into where it's going to sit. Uh, metering pins serve to retard the flow of oil as the struts are compressed. Okay, I'm going to blow through a couple more of these and just see. The brake, number 11, the brake that we took that I, we took apart, and you guys did that PowerPoint, ready to arrange it in order, that's a Cleveland brake. The braking action of a Cleveland brake is accomplished by compressing the rotating disc between two opposing brake lines. How is equal pressure on both sides of the disc assured? The answer is B, by allowing the caliper to float automatically. You guys will get to take one of these apart. When we do our makeup, our half day makeup, you guys will take one of these apart. That'll be one of our stations. Okay. Uh, we didn't talk too much about it. Number 13 is an a, a expander type brake. That's actually, um, that's actually an antique airplane. So, and I just didn't have the time to really go into it while we were trying to get all this other stuff done. But sometimes with ASA, especially on these old antique airplane questions, yeah, I just memorize the question and go on. Okay, there's question number 14 on a brake D booster. Installed where high pressure in the hydraulic system 3000 is used to operate brakes that are designed to work at a lower pressure. It's a D booster. It's and number 14 talked about a slippage mark. All right, I'm going to take a quick look just to see if there's anything I really think I need to go over. So a lot of these are are uh, some of them are just stuff. It's a good way to learn some of the information too when you get asked questions. So I think about oh, I think about a third or half of the questions are going to come from this pool. Probably half the questions will come from this pool. So if you figure there's 35 questions, you guys can make it through that easy enough. And about half of them will be that. You guys got any questions on, uh, on this semester? Wow, it's a lot of stuff. Not really. I'm not okay. Well, let me see. Today is Thursday. I've got office hours at seven o'clock uh, on um, here on Zoom, it's in the announcement section. I got office hours on Monday night. And if you also, you can, you can call me or text me and uh, if you got a question on something. When you, get ready to take the, when you get ready to take the test, on Friday, you'll see a link and it'll say link for the final exam. You can take it Saturday, you can take it Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, just take it by Thursday, by Thursday evening uh, when you're ready. And I think it's, it'll take you about, it'll be, it'll all be multiple choice. You guys will be done with this test. And now well, when I give a test and it's multiple choice, usually I see the first people leaving after about seven minutes and most people are done <laughs> within 30. So it'll be a time test, but it'll be, uh, you'll have enough time. I think it'll be like a 45 minute test. Gotcha. So. And 
Kelly, if you got any questions, type it now, but uh, I think we'll call it quits, guys. It's been a long afternoon, but we are done for the semester. Uh, I'll be available for office hours, but um, you guys get this, try to get everything handed in by next Friday, all your labs and all that stuff by next Friday and get your final taken. We're gonna get an eye on this until we get back together and we got a half a day of makeup for this class. So my other classes are, are better in that I can give a grade, but since we couldn't work on the airplane, there was just a couple of these things we could not do, so. Understandable. Yep. So, all right. And then we're off for a couple of weeks. We'll be off for till the 10th. How much more you got left, Q? Out of what? You got another, you got another semester or two left for your A&P, don't you? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got one more semester for the rest of my power plant, and then I'll be done. Oh, okay. I, I, I got to do, uh, I'll probably do another semester, because I still got to do the, uh, the little... Uh, the the A&P classes, I'll be able to finish next semester, but to get my associates, I'll still have to take a semester after that. So I'm not okay. trying to, I'm not trying to rush through it. I mean, I've waited this long in my life with another semester, so I'm not, I'm, try, I'm not trying to rush through it. So. Hey, what's it another is, semester when the, when the economy's bad? Exactly. This is a like good, I, this is a good place to be right now. Exactly. I was thinking about that earlier because it's like, I got, I got nowhere to really go anyway. Plus, I know there's not a lot of aviation places that are hiring right now. Well, so. the fact is, any degrees you get just move you higher up in the pack. Exactly. So if, you, if you're able to get your associate now, you get working. Let's say you get a job, you're out in <laughs> Wyoming. But if you're making great money, <laughs> there's nothing to do. You can go back online or something, get your bachelor's. And then there's not many mechanics. There's not many A&P mechanics with their bachelors. Oh, Even really? if you look at, at people who teach, you know, if you look at all the teachers, all the adjuncts and stuff, there's mm -hmm. not many that have a bachelor's. And then there's, there's, it's a desert for a master's degree. You find an right. A&P with a master's degree. That's pretty, that's pretty <laughs> slim. There's a few, but there's not many. See, but and that's even, even bachelors, you can go into management pretty easy and you make a lot more money. Right. So you'll make a, you know, you'll make a, a factor of what, what mechanics are making. 